Yeah, so can you define what dative bond is? So dative bond is a bond that is formed when a lone pair is donated to an atom with an empty orbital. How is dative bond different from a regular covalent bond? Just in the way that it is made. It's not different as far as the properties are concerned. It's no different from as far as the angles are concerned. But everything else is exactly the same, except, of course, for the name itself. So the dative bond is only different as far as the name goes. Other than that, it is exactly the same. So now we know bonds are made. So there is one concept that I want to discuss today, which will allow us to figure out why then we said that there is ionic bond, there's metallic bond, there is covalent bond. Why do we have all those sorts of differentiations between these values or these uh, different bonds? So if there is only one way of making any bond and that is basically overlap of orbitals, there is no other way of making bonds. So every atom when it has orbitals, which are incomplete, whether they have half electrons in there or whether they are completely incomplete, they're empty. They just try to overlap those orbitals in hope of getting a complete orbital. It can be one atom donating two electrons, sharing the or completely filled orbital with the other one. Like in the case of ammonia becoming ammonium, it could be uh, one orbital being completely empty, trying to find a lone pair. It could be one orbital that is half filled and another orbital that is half filled. And the whole point is to get a symmetric cloud. That's what they want to do at the end. Now, we do know that when they bond, electrons are shared, but we also know from O levels and even uh, in A levels, we have seen that electrons are not always shared like that. There is a thing called ionic bond where electrons are transferred. So how does that work? So of course it works by heterolytic fission, but what causes heterolytic fission or in what scenario will electron be always be transferred in a way that a covalent bond will form and then the electron will be transferred. So for that, we have to understand a concept which is called electronegativity and another concept which is opposite to that, which is electropositivity. Okay, so that's the concept that we have to focus on. So electronegativity. Again, it's something that is related to the atom itself. It's a property of an element or the property of an atom. That's what electronegativity is. So if I were to define it, it will be the tendency or the ability of an atom to attract a shared pair of electrons. That's what it is. So it's the ability of an atom to attract a shared pair of electrons. So can I say electronegativity of a molecule? No, it's the ability of an atom. And uh, that atom, what does it depend on? Obviously, it depends on the charge from the, the attraction from the nucleus and also the other electrons that are already there. So what happens if two things that bond together have different electronegativity? So let's figure this out. How do we measure electronegativity? We have what we call Pauling scale. So Pauling scale is pretty much the most common scale that we have of measuring electronegativity values. And what it does is that it goes from a zero to four. So the highest value, which is four is for chlorine. And the lowest value that we have so far is 0 0.7 for francium. So there's francium with 0 0.7 and fluorine with four. So what does it show? It's just telling me that thing that has a very high value. It is going to attract the atom really. Uh, it is going to attract the shared pair strongly. And the thing that is a really big atom that is one stark difference that we see that fluorine is a really, really small atom and francium is a really huge, a big atom. So what exactly is going on here? So again, remember it's the valence electron in which there's the electron pair and there's the nucleus A, there's the nucleus B, they're trying to pull on these pairs. So I can show that as this and the electron pair is right in the middle. Let's start over there, like a tug of war. The two of them are pulling on them and uh, whoever wins is the one that has greater force there. So one thing is simple. We need to figure out what factors this depends on. So number one, if these electrons try to come close to it, 
if there is an inner shell it might repel them so that is called shielding so shielding plays a role more shielding lower electronegativity no wonder inner electrons will push the electrons away and also the size it's easier to attract things that are close so the nucleus will find it easier to attract a shared pair that's really close to it and things that are far it wouldn't be able to then the nuclear ch charge so if you have a more uh, protons they are going to pull it strongly but nuclear charge is not that effective when it comes to attracting a shared pair because the other electrons other nucleus is also pulling on it so these factors do play a role there that the inner electrons repel the outer electrons the ones that have been shared the other atom is also pulling on it and uh, the size of the atom matters so why is fluorine so strong because fluorine has a very specific uh, set of electronic structure because fluorine fluorine is a really small atom and it is a really reactive atom because of that that it's a small atom that needs just one electron not many electrons just one so it finds it easier to attract the shared pair so fluorine has the highest value uh, but here's the thing this is just an average picture you when they're in a molecular orbital the bond that we get is we don't always get a pure covalent bond because electrons are always moving around and they can be towards one nucleus more than the other so uh yeah so nuclear charge is basically that if you have more protons they are going to attract the shared pair more because there will be a stronger attraction because of that high positive charge now we have falling scale we have electronegativity and turns out every atom that we have we have assigned it a value all right so if you go to p table and uh, that's a website p table there you will find electronegativity of every atom so if you go over there you will see that what is the electron negativity value for every atom on the very first page so for example if i go for fluorine it is 4 in fact 3.98 but we approximate it to 4 if i go for nitrogen it is 3.04 with oxygen it is 3.4 and with chlorine is 3.16 so four elements for which you need to know the order fluorine then oxygen then nitrogen then chlorine okay so that is how the electronegativity value decreases so fluorine is the highest then oxygen then nitrogen and then chlorine oh, sorry it's not that way thoda sa ulta ho gaya it should be this yeah that is the order in which the electronegativity increases so you can see that that is so four all the way to 3. Point something 3.04 or something but these are the most electronegative elements that we have now isse hota kya hai so first of all if two things are equally electronegative let's say fluorine with fluorine so the electron pair is going to be roughly in the middle of course it's not entirely in the middle they're moving around thoda bahut it thoda bahut vibration variations hoti rehti hain but overall this fluorine is pulling on it with the same force as this fluorine we say that they both have same electronegativity so the difference in electronegativity is zero and when that is the case there is no overall charge because both of these electrons are being pulled towards each nucleus equally so if they are being pulled here and they are being pulled here this thing will call it dipole moment i'll explain what dipole is in a bit so there is no overall dipole moment it's a vector quantity and if there is equal vectors on opposite sides they obviously cancel each other out so this molecule of fluorine is what we call non polar so there is no dipole moment we call it non polar let's try another one let's say i have oxygen they're sharing this two electrons both of them have the electronegativity of uh, let me check the value the value is 3.44 so both of them are pulling on it with 3.44 so towards the left towards the right and they are equal they cancel each other out which shows that there is also no overall dipole moment the delta electronegativity is zero 
the difference in electronegativity is zero. And that shows that they are going to form a non-polar bond, uh, a non-polar molecule. They are equally electronegative. So they both have equal ability of attracting a shared pair, which means that on average, electron pair is going to be in the middle. All right, so same with chlorine and chlorine or hydrogen with hydrogen and so on and so forth. What happens if one of the atoms is like, if one of the atoms in A and B is more electronegative than the other? Sure, if it is slightly more, let's say B is slightly more, instead of being in the middle, the electrons will be pulled towards B more than they're pulled towards A. And what does it do? It creates a slight negative charge on B and slight positive charge on A. Why? Because B has more than its, uh, what you call fair share of electrons or electron density, because there is more electron in the same area than it should have if it was a purely covalent bond. So it becomes slightly negative and uh, A becomes slightly positive because of this. And this small symbol is how you draw it. You draw an S, then you curve it like that. So that's a delta, okay? It's a small delta and it means small, okay? So delta negative means small positive charge or slightly negative uh, charge and small delta positive means slightly positive charge. So what this does is that now the electrons are being pulled more towards one atom than the other. So we say that there are poles and these things, these two things, they are poles. Okay. So these are poles. In fact, you have two of them. So we call it a dipole and the dipole has a direction. The dipole is towards B. So we show it with an arrow like that. And this is your dipole moment. So this molecule has a dipole moment and we call this molecule a polar molecule. So this molecule is polar because there is a pole on each end of it. And they, because of that, there's a dipole moment towards B because B is more uh, electronegative than the other. So let me give an example of that. Uh, Sir, if you take hydrogen, yep. Agar, agar ek fluorine or fluorine ka bond hai, Usko bhi hum hmm. dipole kahenge, but uski movement nahi hogi. So there is not going to be a dipole there because dipole only occurs if there's a slight positive on one side and slight negative on the other side. In fluorine, you can't get that. Kyunki wo dono side se equal kar hai, wo cancel out ho jayega. There is no overall positive or negative charge. So jab wo banega hi nahi, to uski wada se, uski upar dipole moment zero ho jayegi. So for example, I'm taking the example of HCl. So the electronegativity of chlorine, again, let me go towards uh, the periodic table that we had. The periodic table make chlorine was 3.16. So the value of the electronegativity, the difference is 3.16 of chlorine and hydrogen has 2.2. So minus 2.2. And that is uh, 0 0.96 or 94. Yep. So that is a high difference in electronegativity. And why is that? That is because number one, uh, chlorine has 17 protons pulling on this pair, but hydrogen has just one electron, uh, one proton that's pulling on it. Similarly, chlorine has, there is some shielding in chlorine and hydrogen is shielding, but because of the stark difference in nuclear charge, uh, chlorine pulls on hydrogen more. So do aapka you get slightly negative charge on chlorine and slightly positive charge on hydrogen. And we say that there's an overall dipole moment like that towards chlorine. So there's a dipole moment towards chlorine. Okay. And because of that dipole moment, what happens is that the cloud is not symmetrical. The electrons are not arranged equally. So Fluorine big, uh, sorry, chlorine, because it's more electronegative, it pulls on the electrons more. So the bond becomes polar. So this is a polar molecule. And just like A and B in the example that you had, of course, uh, the polar bond is where you have a molecular orbital, but you also have slightly positive and negative charges. And you show them with these weird, uh, 
s the delta so you're going to get this so this is a partial or slightly positive and slightly negative charge now overall in the periodic table the smaller the atom greater the electronegativity the bigger the atom bigger the uh, lower the electronegativity so across a period going from left to right we know that the size decreases which means electronegativity increases similarly uh, from top to bottom we know that size increases so electronegativity decreases they're opposite so i can say that overall it goes like that if something is on this side which is francium it has the least electronegativity and on this side i have fluorine which has the highest electronegativity so closer something is to fluorine more electronegative it is but always remember that these four the fluorine oxygen chlorine and nitrogen in that order they are the ones that are most electronegative elements in the periodic table so how is a non polar bond different from polar bond so first of all the non polar bond has uh, same uh, atoms with the same electronegativity or roughly the same electronegativity okay so non polar if i were to make a table so non polar so what are the main differences so small difference in electronegativity uh no overall dipole moment symmetric sharing so symmetric cloud of electrons uh that's not the case in polar bond because large difference in electronegativity so because of that large difference they're going to pull on the electrons more on one side and less on the other side yeah so there is a large difference in electronegativity and because of that there is an overall dipole moment there are slightly positive and negative charges okay so that is why there is a polar bond now obviously the greater the electronegativity difference the greater the polarity so if the difference is high the polarity is going to be really high so how high can the polarity be so for that just remember that there is a value 2.1 if the difference in in electronegativity is between 0 and 0.7 then we say that the bond uh, sorry 0 and 0.4 bond is non polar so how do you know so the difference in electronegativity is less than 0.4 okay and if the difference is greater than 0.4 it's going to be a polar bond so that number is uh, kind of important of course the calculations aren't that much wo aap sitna zyada uski calculation ke upar puchta nahi hai theek hai second if that, that is the case that you have to have slightly negative aur wo apni taraf unko pull kar deta hai is it possible that you get molecules that have polar bonds but the molecule itself is non polar like you can have polar bonds but the overall molecule is not polar so how do we know that the overall molecule is polar that depends on two factors obviously the polarity but also the angles that it has so let me take an example let's suppose i have hcl so i just went through that hcl has slightly negative and slightly positive charges there is going to be a dipole moment so it is polar let's take ammonia so ammonia is like that there is a lone pair here now remember that because of this lone pair and uh, nitrogen having a large difference with hydrogen there is a high chance that there is going to be slightly negative charge here why because agar kisi cheez par lone pairs honge it already has a high electron density so that gives it a high electron neg negativity automatically and uh, then we have slight positive charges on hydrogen because hydrogen has a low electronegativity 2.2 and nitrogen has a high electronegativity so uski wajah se there is a dipole moment towards this there is a dipole moment like this there is a dipole moment towards this so you can see clearly that there is an overall dipole moment towards a um, nitrogen so we can say that overall this molecule is polar because there is a dipole moment towards nitrogen in this let's take the example of water i am just taking the example of water water has two lone pairs on this so there is going to be slight 
slightly negative charge on water because oxygen has a high electronegativity. Hydrogen has a low electronegativity, so hydrogen pairs will have slight positive charge. And then because of this, uh, because of the difference in electronegativity being high, there's going to be a dipole moment towards oxygen from this hydrogen. And there's going to be a dipole moment towards this oxygen from this hydrogen. So overall, you can see that both the arrows are pointing towards oxygen. And because of that, we can say that there is an overall dipole moment in this molecule. So all three of these are polar molecules. Okay. Let's take, let me give you another example. Let's say I have, and I have this. Try to figure out if they have overall dipole moment. And if they do, which of these is more polar? Sir, first one is non-polar. No, it will be polar because overall the molecule acts like this. Uh, you are supposed to get a slightly negative charge here. You will obviously get a slightly positive charge here. And this will be slightly negative, slightly negative. Sure. But here's the thing. Oxygen overall has a much higher polarity. And because of that, overall, the dipole moment towards grows like that. So there is a dipole moment like that. Usually we curved arrow se nahi banate usko. But just to give you an idea, ki because oxygen is the most electronegative here, it is going to pull the electrons towards itself. Hai? Even chlorine ki jo dipole moment hai, wo utni strong nahi rahegi. Jitni oxygen ki ho jayegi. Kyunki wo apni taraf un saare electrons ko pull kar legi. It's going to be the same case here that's going to pull all of it towards itself. We also say that it has an electron withdrawing group, withdrawing property. So things with high electronegativity have an electron withdrawing property that they can pull the electrons towards themselves. So the charge distribution is not going to be quite uh, symmetrical in here. But you can have bonds that are polar, but still have a non-polar molecule. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose I have carbon dioxide and we know carbon dioxide is CO2 with a linear structure. So the bond here, oxygen is slightly negative and this is slightly positive. Why? Because oxygen is more electronegative, carbon is less electronegative and the difference in electronegativity is large. Similarly, this side has the same thing. So there's a dipole moment towards the right and there's a dipole moment of equal size towards the left. So the dipoles cancel. So carbon dioxide is non-polar. So there's no overall dipole moment. So the molecule itself is non-polar. Sure, each bond is polar, but the molecule is non-polar. Let's take another one. Uh, we drew this yesterday, BF3. Now we know that the difference is high, slightly negative, slightly negative, and this is slightly positive. Notice that I'm not writing three delta net positive. I'm just showing slightly positive because the electrons are pulled more towards fluorine and less towards bromine, oh, sorry, boron. So her taraf se wo boron se electron push karte ja rahe, or fluorine ki taraf pull karte ja rahe. So one dipole moment here, one dipole moment here and one dipole moment here. And just like any fact, any vectors that you have, if you add them all, you will see that this is non-polar. Let's look at this diagram from your book. So this is from your book and you can clearly see how these two molecules are that in one of them, the left one, A, this is called tetrachloromethane. Okay. This is non-polar. Why is it non-polar? Because while individual bonds are polar, the dipoles cancel. And because the dipoles cancel, the overall polarity is zero. But in the other one, there is a slight difference. There is a slight positive charge because of hydrogen, because uh, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen and chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. There is a dipole moment towards carbon here and then a dipole moment towards every chlorine to overall dipole moment add up. Okay. The molecule becomes slightly polar. Okay. Let me give you another example. Let's suppose I have 
these two isomers of dichloroethane. Try to figure out if these are polar molecules. Is this going to be polar or not? So again, you have to see that there is a dipole moment or not. So we know that there's going to be slight negative charge here, slight negative charge here. Carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So here a dipole moment. Ban but then chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. So carbon per bhi ek electronegative ek dipole moment. Ban so here dipole moment is taraf ko banega, yahan pe is taraf ko banega. Aur wahan pe aapka dipole moment idhar niche ko flow kar raha hai. Agar mein aur se dekhu, to the vectors are adding in that direction. But on that side, the vectors are adding in opposite direction which shows that the left one is going to be more polar than the other one. So you have to look at individual bonds and then see what are they connected to. So you can see that hydrogen, between hydrogen and carbon, the bond is polar, but not that much as the bond between carbon and chlorine. Now here's the thing. So we have bonds that are polar because uh, there's a large electronegativity difference, but how long before, instead of sharing, the other atom just takes the electron away. Because polarity is all about sharing the electron, right? But sharing it unequally. So there's A, there's B. They have a difference in electronegativity. If the difference is zero, the electrons stay here. If the difference is greater than that, the electrons are pulled towards bromine, uh, sorry, B. How long before B just runs away with the electrons and it can do that. Turns out if the difference in electronegativity is less than 0 0.4, the molecule does not have an, that appreciable overall dipole moment. So it's a non-polar molecule. But if the difference in electronegativity, sorry, is between 0 0.4 and 0, 1.7, it is a polar bond. And if the difference is greater than that, then it's going to be ionic. So what is ionic bond? It is a bond when the difference in electronegativity is so high that the electrons are practically just stripped away from the other atom. So they start by sharing electrons and one atom pulls them so much strongly than the other one that now that one just has lost the electron. And it's not always the case with ions. Of course, they make ions right away when it comes to the ionic character or electronegativity difference between 1.7. With the right environment, these polar molecules can also make ions because you just have to nudge it in the right direction and the electron, instead of being shared unequally, will be transferred to B. And that happens. For example, there's a group of covalent molecules which always have a large difference in electronegativity, but they're polar. And the moment you add them to water, which is also a polar thing, water just takes the, breaks the bond. Wo dipole moment itni increase kar deta hai, usko itna influence kar deta hai, that it just converts to ions. So molecules are able to make ions. That depends a lot on the environment. If you put a polar thing in another polar thing, it is likely to make ions. Note that down somewhere. So for example, what compounds that are covalent always end up making ions, especially in water. Can you think of an ion, a covalent substance that always makes ions, especially in water? Ammonia. Ammonia. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And how about a group of these compounds? Ammonia is one. How about a group of compounds that do this? It's really easy. Acids. Acids always have an H ion, in, a H atom in there in a polar bond. And the moment you add them to water and water influences the environment so much that then they can simply convert it and they can do it. They convert to ions right away. This polarity has a big role to play in the physical properties of things. Because if you have dipoles, then it will attract other dipoles. It's that simple. If you have HCl 
and there is a dipole here and there's a dipole here and there's another HCL and there's a dipole here and there's a dipole here. Wouldn't this attract this positive charge? It will, right? Because there's a slight positive charge here. There's a slight negative charge here. Negative and positive attract each other. So these dipoles attract each other and that attraction is called van der Waals force. In other words, intermolecular force of attraction. Yeah, and it's interesting because make a note of this. Neutral things never attract each other, except for gravity, of course. But as far as these forces, electrostatic forces are concerned, and bonding is always electrostatic, neutral things can't have that. So O levels may hum bachunko kate ki ye molecule dusha molecule ko attract kar rahe. Bhai kaise kar rahe? Charge uspe hani ek dusha ko kaise attract kar rahe? It's an impossibility ke ek cheez hai jo neutral hai wo dusha neutral cheez ko attract kari. Kar hi nahi sakte. Except for gravity again. But now we can see why that is the case. And then we said that acids are covalent but they dissolve in water. But oil is covalent, but doesn't dissolve in water. Why, why, why is that? Again, because water is polar, it dissolves other polar things. But oil is non-polar, so it doesn't dissolve in polar things. Because attraction by the hogi, to mix mein karenge, na? So these van der Waal forces arise because of these dipoles. And polarity has a big role to play in there. In fact, electronegativity has a big role to play in terms of boiling point, melting point, density, volatility, uh, basically all the physical properties of things. They are influenced heavily by the difference in electronegativity. And we will explore that further after we are done with uh, these uh, bonds. So we will hold that thought here that how will this affect the physical properties of stuff but for now just remember that all the intermolecular forces come from polarity and polarity comes from difference in electronegativity and that difference is based on this difference if the two atoms are sharing with a small difference in electronegativity it will be a covalent bond which is non-polar and if the difference is between 0 0.4 and 1.7 it will be polar covalent bond and if it is greater than 1.7, it will be ionic bond. So now what do we know? We know that there is no covalent bond and ionic bond, and there is no binary bonds. Now we have a spectrum of bonds. There are bonds that are purely covalent. There are bonds that are slightly covalent and slightly ionic. There are bonds that are completely ionic. And it all depends on how the difference in electronegativity is, how big or small it is. And also the geometry of the molecule plays a role there. That even if the bond is polar, if the geometry doesn't allow it, maybe the molecule will become non-polar. For example, in the case of carbon dioxide that we saw here somewhere. So that's the idea of electronegativity, which we will explore further the effects that it has on things.